I wanted to give a little perspective on um, women in crystallography. And I'm going to tell you about two things here. Uh, the, they aren't both advertised, but first I'll tell you a little bit of a history, particularly pertaining to early life, family, and career paths for some, uh, some of our crystallographic mothers. Um, and then I will talk about a survey that I did of 90 senior crystallographers in the ACA, 24 of whom responded, and I'll be summarizing their results to give you an idea what uh, the next generation of women crystallographers is uh, facing. The Braggs who started all of this with the first crystal structure in 1913, William Henry Bragg uh, built the instrument to enable the first uh, crystal patterns, and his son, William Lawrence Bragg, <coughs> discovered the relationship between what's in the crystal and the diffraction <coughs> pattern and derived Bragg's law. And we see a picture of Bragg at the top, and his son with von Lowley and von Kuchen, very appropriately. William Lawrence Bragg trained Carolyn McGillery, who worked with MC Escher, as we just heard, on the crystallographic plane groups. And William Henry Bragg, in turn, uh, trained several people who either were women or trained other women. So William Henry Bragg uh, trained Kathleen Yardley, born in 1903, the youngest of 10 children who attended Bedford College for women at the University College London. William Bragg happened to be, her William Henry Bragg happened to be her examiner at age 19 when she was going for the Bachelor of Science. And she scored the highest of, for 10 years um, in, her, in the University College. So Bragg's first question, he called her in specially to talk to her and said, how did you manage to do so well? Which is kind of an embarrassing question, actually. She didn't remember how she answered that. But then and there, he offered her a coveted research position. One of her colleagues had actually tried 150 applications before he got a research position. So this is very exciting. And I it did turn out dark, but I had that in uh, Transparency. I have hexavalent benzene, which is what um, Kathleen Yardley, then Lonsdale, uh, was very well known for one of her best um, accomplishments here. So um, she studied succinic acid and related compounds, and in 1927 married Thomas Lonsdale and moved to Leeds, where he had a job. But she was able to get a position at the University of Leeds, where she worked on uh, hexamethyl benzene and gave the first proof for a planar benzene ring. Later on, when she went back to London, there was no x-ray available to her dismay, so she started measuring diamagnetic susceptibilities and showed, in fact, that the pi orbitals are localized on the molecular level using uh, diamagnetic susceptibility. She had three children between 29 and 34, and she worked at night then to accommodate the children during the day and the research at night. <clears throat> With Asbury, she uh, completed the 230 space group tables and copied the mathematical images so that they would be correct. She copied them all by hand, and they were printed by hand by photolithograph. She's a very careful person. In 1936, for her ethane derivative study, she got the Doctor of Science. She was one of the first women elected to the Royal Society. There were two elected in 1945, and she was the first woman professor at University College London. She actually started the department when Bragg died at the University College London, and she was the first woman president of IUCR. She was a pacifist, a Quaker, and a prison reformer. William Henry Bragg <coughs> trained John Desmond Bernal, Bernal or Sage as he was called, <coughs> trained Dorothy Crowfoot, born 1910. You'll hear much more about this in Jenny Glusker's talk on Wednesday AM, but I'm going to concentrate on some early experiences in her life, 
couple of uh, uh, career paths. So at 10, Dorothy had a crystal school project where she grew alum and copper sulfate right in the classroom. She was so excited about it, she ran home and she replicated it at home, made her own crystals at home. At 13, she went with her parents to Sudan. Her father was working in Africa. And her mother took them to visit a welcome chemist, A.F. Joseph. She was curious about a mineral that was growing in her backyard. Actually, they were teaching her how to pan for minerals, and she found this mineral. So she brought it back to uh, Joseph, and he helped her identify it. That really excited her about chemistry. At 16, her mother bought her a book, a children's book, written by William Henry Bragg. Where's the next generation of children's books and crystallography? You probably are the ones that are going to write them. So, because um, there's a tremendous impact of that. Jenny Glusker, she may talk about this um, on Wednesday, said when she was in school, she read a Marie Curie book. And that was a very influential factor on her in choosing science. Her mother was a self-taught botanist and a great supporter. After Somerville College graduation, this is the kind of thing women find uh, often, uh, she couldn't get a job. Again, she went to A.F. Joseph, and he recommended J.D. Burnell. In 1927, she married Thomas Hodgkin, and they had three children. She notes good health at home and a very supportive husband. She entered a uh, very, she in, um, endured a very primitive laboratory conditions and a lot of temporary positions until later in life. This is actually very similar to Marie Curie, who worked in an unheated shed for much of her life, didn't have her own laboratory until Nobel Prize moved things along. Often recognition came from outside the home location rather than inside. She believed in person-to-person -person diplomacy and visited Russia with her scientific research. In fact, urged her student, Margaret Thatcher, to recognize Russia long before the US thought about it. And she went to China. Uh, as many of you know, the insulin structure is published jointly with China. She was soft-spoken, insightful, and firm. And she was active for peace. She had remarkable, remarkable visual skills with 2D Fourier maps, and Patterson. She could visualize these in three dimensions when they were very, very challenging for many other people. And she trained a number of members of the ACA, in particular Jenny Glusker, the 1979 president of the ACA, Barbara Lowe, Clara Shoemaker, and Carol uh, Hubert, and at least nine other women, as well as training men. And you already saw the Google Doodle, which is penicillin which was incredibly important in World War II. She determined the structure, which then allowed synthesis of that so that it could treat uh, very trivial wounds that would be lethal during the uh, war. So I like to say penicillin, crystallography, saves lives. Rosalind Franklin, you may have heard about um, in various capacities, she was born a little bit later, 1920, for, from wealthy London parents, but she rebelled against the, uh, what she was expected to do was to volunteer in science and not actually do science or volunteer in many things. But she wanted to study science. She got very excited by it and she chose a very simple lifestyle, different from her parents. She attended Cambridge Girton College, uh, which was a women's college. And she did research on coal during World War II. This research, which I've often heard about, I found was very instrumental in the field of high strength carbon fibers and also for control rods for nuclear uh, fission. She was a brilliant experimentalist, particularly she worked well with poorly, poorly ordered samples. And this was, um, so she, said she loved children. She confided this to uh, Vittorio Lozzati's wife, but she didn't want to subject them to a scientist's life, so she never married, never had children. She had a short three-year period in Paris uh, where she learned more about crystallography, and she was described by um, 
her biographer, Ann Sarah, David Sarah's wife, as fun, slightly prankish, and teasing, and of course, brilliant. She was hired by the head of an x-ray group at King's College in London, based on her experimental prowess, and to study the DNA fibers alone. However, a former group graduate student of the lab head, who was Maurice Wilkins, uh, was also in the lab. He was actually out of the lab when she was hired, but when he came back to the lab, he kind of assumed that she'd been hired to prepare samples for the laboratory, and so he wanted to involve himself in that. Um, Rose Rosalind, immediately when she started studying DNA, and she was marvelous at uh, handling these very difficult fibers, she found there were two forms of DNA, a high humidity and a low humidity form, the A form and B form of DNA. And of course, everybody else had been looking at a mixture, so it was a big mess. But for once, she had something that actually would show the structure of the DNA. So she got a wonderful photograph of B DNA, but she wanted to be very cautious about the analysis. And she also was looking for uh, research colleagues that she could banter ideas with. Well, this was not what Maurice Wilkins was like. Maurice Wilkins was very withdrawn. He didn't like arguments, but he, you know, he liked to kind of be right or assert himself. It was an old boy network at King's College. It was not at all collegial. Women ate separately from the men scientists. So, in fact, uh, all the science got talked about at meals. So she was never privy to the lab science. And Maurice Wilkins casually one day showed the photograph of BDNA to Watson, who was visiting at a seminar. And Watson uh, didn't have the skills to produce that photograph. Many, there weren't hardly any who could. But he was also very competitive and he disliked Rosalind. So based on her data and a confidential report by Franklin, Watson, Crick, and Wilson, and Wilson published, Wilkins, that should be, sorry, published first, but the editor requested, uh, invited her to submit a paper on ADNA, which shows up with, um, with that first publication. Needless to say, that was uh, not a happy time for Rosalind. And she moved to Birkbeck College with J.D. Bernal again and started to work on plant viruses, um, tobacco mosaic virus, and later was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and died at 37, a number of years before the Nobel Prize was awarded to Watson, Crick, and Wilkins. A few more early women that are important in other disciplines is one is Helen McGaw. She was born in 1937, one of seven children. Again, a large family. She studied, studied normal and heavy water with J.D. Bernal. A very key paper uh, she, was, she had published on hydrogen bonding, which was one of the first to recognize the unique role of hydrogen in hydrogen bonding. And an Antarctic island is named for her. Helen solved the structure of barium titanate, uh, which had a great deal of impact on the field of ceramics. It's a ferroelectric, a, a ferroelectric material, and it's now used in capacitors found in ultrasound machines, infrared cameras, microphones, and other transducers. In 1989, she was recognized with the Rosalind Medal from the Mineral Society of America, which was very unusual. I don't think there are any other women who've gotten that. A.M. Glazer, her student, said she had a rare ability to visualize in 3D. She would take a structure, rotate it in her mind, and sketch it from any viewpoint. And the second crystallographer I want to talk about, not remotely crystallography, she was a brilliant mathematician, but she ventured into crystallography in a rather uh, traumatic way, actually. Um, uh, but she was a brilliant mathematician and who got hires on, highest honors at Cambridge. Some of you who this may mean something to, she was a wrangler, which means she got first in her third year of studies, which is never, very, very rarely a woman would be uh, a wrangler. So she published 42 papers by 1929, and with 15 of these, she was an awarded a doctor of science. So she's a prolific publisher. She also studied philosophy with Bertrand Russell um, as well. 
family uh, matters that, and, and she was married, uh, but, um, uh, and, and she maintained her maiden name, um, but uh, her daughter was born in 1928, in 1930 she divorced. She ventured into biochemistry. Uh, she was trying to rationalize with symmetry and mathematical models a lot of the data on biochemistry long before the, uh, well, in the throes of beginnings of chemical bonds being thought of and peptide bonds. And she got in a controversy with Pauling over her mo backbone model, which is called the cyclone, <laughs> which did not turn out to be right, but it was, there was a very heated controversy about that. And, and she uh, had an extremely um, difficult time during that period. She taught at Smith's and was very beloved by her students. And one of her students, um, has, a mathematician, has written a book, I Died for Beauty, which is a story of Dorothy Lynch. So now to the survey of ACA women crystallographers, and I will go through this rather quickly. These were women over the age of 50. 90 surveys were sent out, 24 returned. 11 questions on early life, family, career path. Topics range from childhood stories to advice for students today. Many had unconventional careers to just anticipate a little bit, and many in or through research institutions. So the first question was, do you have stories from childhood that uh, interested you in science. And I was thinking of many of the things that happened to Dorothy. And what I got were answers about things that um, sparked the interest in science. So one was support by parents. And this is something we've seen by earlier women and those of you who have children or will have children, something to consider. That uh, this was uh, nearly half of them described without being asked uh, that both parents or one parent were very important and supporting their interest in science. Slightly more mentioned fathers that were influential, and only a slightly less uh, mother support. Oh, those, are, those are the ones who mentioned only a father or a mother. And seven reported, now here we have some of their in, very interesting interests. One was that mathematics was a very, they were good in mathematics, and therefore crystallography was a good match. This was very interesting to me. Five of the people reported that they had many different collections of things, and that sparked an interest in numbers and differences. Rocks, shells, the things of nature, they ranged to, from buttons to china horses to postage stamps, so many different things. Um, and three people talked about a very big interest in books that allowed them to access to things like crystallographic information. Two mentioned visualization, and I want to, you to notice that two of the women I already talked about had particular skills in visualization. I, at the 86th conference to recognize Gay Denae's retirement uh, in the IUCR meeting, a woman mentioned that in early organic chemistry, they noticed at the beginning of the semester that the women were much better in visualization of molecules, might have been general chemistry, I'm not sure, and then uh, than the men. And that was true even at the end of the semester. So perhaps there's something going on there. Um, the second question was what first interest you in science? One uh, number of people said crystallography solving health problems, so big problems, higher math or applied computing. The beauty of the molecules, DNA and proteins. For two of them at the same institution, uh, there was a particular mentor that was very pivotal in suggesting them, interesting them in crystallography. One of them heard a lecture on M.C. Escher, and that's what, and she says, I was hooked. A number of them used language like I was hooked or I fell in love with. Passionate words. Um, and one told of uh, looking at telling somebody telling them about the benzene structure, she immediately back went and looked it up in the original literature to look at it because it was very exciting to her. And um, math plus answering important questions and the beauty of models together was another reason. Sorry, this is a bit off. But what main mentors helped you in your career? So 13 uh, said about half. Uh, or about half of the sample said they had both men and women mentors. 
10 women had only male mentors. So you men out there, you're very important in mentoring young women crystallographers. Two had only woman mentors. This perhaps represents the much larger population of um, males in um, faculty positions. Um, two men mentioned most often as important were Dorothy Hodgkin, Linus Pauling, so two were daughters in the sense that they studied with Dorothy Hodgkin. Um, one of was a Linus, Linus Pauling granddaughter, also mentioned was Helen Berman, uh, one of our next speakers, Don Wiley, and Bernie Siegel. Um, and sometimes someone would mention someone in another department or a fellow PhD student or postdoc or their crystallography professor. Did you have a conventional or unconventional career? 60% uh, felt their careers were unconventional. Of those, 12 were at research institutions, either on the research faculty, or they held such position for a period of time, or they were at a research institution. Two were in companies, several more went through companies uh, in their career path. Four managed x-ray facilities, some of those might be in companies too. Two were in a medical field, either professionally, one was a dentist, and one was a hospital administrator, although she had done a bunch of research. Um, several did not get tenure, but found alternate career paths that were satisfying. A few went through much different work. One was a factory worker, a secretary in the army, and a humanities major. One moved from a facilities manager to a full professor. It's quite a jump. And three found careers outside of the US. <coughs> Did you have children, and how did you manage family and work? 19 out of 24 had children, and three of those were single mothers. 11 noted helpful husbands. Many had nannies, babysitters, or daycare, and one even helped start the daycare. One managed young children while getting tenure, however, most did not. Several decided to restrict their professional activity for themselves or their spouses, and some said they had to be very well organized or worked particularly at home outside nine to five hours. And one left science to manage family issues. Which woman had a positive influence on you? All but four named specific women, nine of them mentioned Dorothy Hodgkin, who you see here. Four noted Rosalind Franklin, three said Jenny Glasker, twice named were Helen Berman and myself, and numerous other women were mentioned. Was being a woman an asset or a problem? Several said, it depends. Sometimes it's more difficult to get hired in an academic position as a woman. Sometimes it was easier particularly if one's institution is under a court order, <laughs> as mine was. And this was more likely after the 80s. Promotion and equal pay definitely lagged behind. So that was uh, much more difficult being a woman. Salaries were quite divergent. Um, one of our crystallographers that I talked to at Hawaii advocated extensively for, hiring women, for increasing women's salaries and she was phenomenally successful. Um, and that was Fran Jernak. And she went to whatever level she needed to go to to uh, get uh, increases in salary. So one still has to fight. We're not, definitely not there. Some noted it was easier if you were not the only woman around. And others said it was an advantage to be the only one, but you have to work very hard. One recounted the old saw, every woman should look like a girl, act like a lady, and work like a dog to be considered half as good as a man. And fortunately, it was easy. <laughs> Question eight, what are your most important contributions? 10 out of 24 reported their scientific accomplishments as the most important contribution. Seven said they valued most training or helping students including one who developed educational software. Two valued the many gems of structures that they determined. One founded a structural data bank. Another established international standards 
for polycrystalline data. One felt work in the country crystallographic association and in formation of a regional affiliate was most important, the most important contribution they had made. And this woman was in Latin America. And one brought a drug to the market. What advice would you give for young women today? Tackle big problems. Work internationally. Work hard or harder. Do your personal best. It's okay to combine career and family, although some chose not to. Academic science is flexible, but be super organized. Establish a discipline of writing grants and papers. Get a good mentor, and this is exceedingly important. I would encourage every young woman and every young man to get a good mentor, but particularly women, because once you're hired, getting to tenure is a struggle and you really need some help. It's easier for males to do great work, but if you sacrifice something, you can also accomplish great things. Seek alternative paths and collaborators. Take time to live fully, dream, enjoy science, and don't lose your femininity. What advice for young crystallographers? Some said pretty much the same. But there were other things. Learn and use multiple technologies to answer a big question. Stick to the facts and be critical. That was very mentioned by a lot of people. Ask who are successful and, and uh, who have done some great things and get them to advocate for you. And I would really encourage that as well. Enjoy the beauty of structures and the power of the crystallographic method. Be curious, keep learning, and ask good questions. Learn to write well. And what is the role of women in science in the common good? Remember that Dorothy and Kathleen were very active in peace work. There were many varied er answers. Some said no difference between men and women. Many pointed to Dorothy Hodgkin and Rosalind Franklin as role models. Dorothy advocated for women. Um, and there, one woman said that the bonds of friendship between women crystallographers have crossed country and ideological divides. So it's really important to think of women-women crystallographer interactions. Women who uh, bring patience, perspective, and balance to the community because they do that naturally, just to get along in their lives. And some conclusions, we still need to advocate for equal salary and promotion for women scientists. We need to go the extra mile for women scientists. Support women uh, scientists, both young ones and those climbing the ladder for their chosen career path. I want to just mention very briefly a letter from, uh, that uh, Gay Donay mentioned when she asked for a recommendation to McGill from Martin Berger and from Kathleen Lonsdale. Martin Berger said, she was very good for a woman, which was a little, you know, hard to take. Kathleen Lonsdale wrote an unqualified letter of praise, which basically got her the job at McGill. So uh, we need to think about going the extra mile for recommendations for women, particularly because they will be looked at with a, ja with a jaundiced eye, I believe. Seek alternative tracks when you need to, and don't forget to live fully. Senior women scientists understand hard work and prejudice, and I think we need to lead the way in getting uh, to advocate for diversity in crystallography and in all professional fields. The problems are so hard today that we cannot do it without many different races contributing. So we really need everybody's help. And I just want to mention my primary sources for the information on the history were Women in Crystallography, a chapter in Women of Science Writing the Record uh, by uh, Maureen Julian, and Nobel's Prize Women in Science, Their Lives, Struggles, and Momentous Discoveries by Sharon Birch in the crown. She did a marvelous job of interviewing former students of all these people. And for Helen McGaw, a um, a site on uh, Ulster biographies, Northern Ireland.
And I thank you very much for your attention.